Welcome to the podcast for the West Side Church of Christ that meets in Killeen, Texas. Today we bring you another practical lesson from God's inspired word, the Bible. Some of the exciting things about being with other congregations is meeting new people and hearing fine song leaders and hearing them do such a good job that it's encouraging uh, to hear young people doing the good that they're doing. And I'm so grateful that I was here and tonight I hope that our study to the Word of God will help you feel glad that you have been here as well. One of the thoughts that w- the last song that we just said, I just thought, is, I'm, I'm going to repeat it. Verse 1. Sweet are the promises, kind is the Word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see. He the great example is, and pattern for me. That did not originate from the restoration movement of trying to encourage people to follow the pattern of the New Testament church. That began when Jesus began walking into the world and telling people, come follow me. He was a disciple maker. He came to be their Lord, most certainly. He came to be their Redeemer, But he came to be their shepherd, and he came to be their master. And everyone in this room, he came to be the same to you. So as uh, Michael, who took my steam away from me from my introduction about my mom, (laughs) she drew sketches of what she wanted her art to be. And I'm going to tell you, that the sketches that we're looking at in this series, you need to realize the sketches that were drawn weren't drawn by me. They weren't drawn by a Church of Christ board. They were drawn by the Master who came to call you to follow Him. So last night when we talked, we talked about what in John chapter 1 describes as the first calling of disciples where it is not the calling to apostleship that sometimes it is confused to be. Instead, it is the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry. John is preparing the way, making the path straight, as the prophet said he would, to make people's hearts ready to hear the message of the king. Just because he was preparing that does not mean that the people's hearts really were ready. But there were some disciples who listened to what he said. And in listening to those words, when John saw Jesus come to be baptized of him, John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Those disciples had already heard the message of the coming King that John had been proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then when Jesus comes, Those disciples standing with John who were disciples of him, they heard what John said. And so on the next day, they too, when they are standing next to John, say, you need to go. And they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned around and said, what are you looking for? And they said, tell us where you're staying. And so Jesus says, come and see. And Jesus called them gently and carefully because he knew the promises that he had come to bring them. But that occurs before Jesus has done what we think of as his public ministry. He has yet to work his first public miracle. That's going to happen in John 2. It is yet before he walks into the temple in Jerusalem where there are money changers and runs them out. And it is while John the baptizer is still proclaiming the message that he is the one, he is the one, even John will make the observation about that in John chapter 3 before the incident that we talked about last night in John 1. Open your Bible to Matthew and look in chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4.
Beginning in verse 12, it says, As Jesus, after His temptation, now announces His ministry in Galilee, when He heard that John had been arrested. What happens between verse 11 and verse 12 in Matthew chapter 4 is John chapter 1 through John chapter 4. That what is recorded there is not recorded in Matthew's account. And Matthew tells us John has been arrested. But we're going to look and spend, we're going to go back to that. But I want you to look in Luke chapter 5, where the bulk of the lesson is going to come from. Why did I say all of that? When I was young, I thought, <clears throat> since every story I watched in television took 30 minutes, that what I read in the Gospels took 30 minutes. That a lot of times we look at the development of people becoming disciples that if I don't go in and they obey the gospel in the same hour of the night, there's just never going to be an opportunity for us to reach them again. And we don't see discipleship the way Jesus did. And I think it's because we do not see Jesus the way He needs to be seen. But most importantly, it is because we do not see ourselves in the men that He called. Because in the beginning, when He calls those first four, Philip and Nathaniel, Peter and Andrew, I'm sorry, Peter and John, look at the story. Where are the rest of them? And we might think, well, They followed Jesus, they became disciples of Him, so that must mean every day for the rest of their life, they went everywhere Jesus went. They didn't. And sometimes we have the idea that if if they became a disciple of Jesus, then that meant that they were going to surrender their their livelihood, they were going to stop being fishermen, that their whole life stopped and it turned into church work. Well, that didn't happen either. And it isn't because was Jesus a failure as a teacher? Was Jesus a failure at communicating what it really meant to be a follower? No. Oh, it's because those twelve apostles were sick and and morally depraved and worldly minded people? No, that's not it either. All of them were just like you and me. It took six months from John chapter 1, roughly, to where we're about to read in Luke chapter 5 to occur. For six months, they, first four, had been called to be a disciple. And while some harmonists who put together the Gospels have put that time frame, I'm not sure it's exactly six, six, I think it's closer to like nine, maybe even up to a year. But the choices they had to make, everyone, are not necessarily the choices that we think that they did. They had to make much more far-reaching choices in their lives many times than we ever have to. But notice chapter 5. We're going to read this section first. As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus, this is reading from the Christian Standard Bible, As a crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon replied, Master, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish. And they began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. 
When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I am a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. And when they brought the boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now the point I want in bringing up the chronology of the story is, they left everything and followed him. Does your Bible say that? How many of you have left everything for Jesus? Just think about that. And I'm not suggesting to you that the apostles are not really telling the truth. I think they are. But like we oftentimes speak when I will say that my wife is the most beautiful woman in the world. I would say that if she was here. I would say that if she wasn't here. But realistically, guess what that really means? She is the most beautiful woman to me in the world. All of you other husbands, y'all can have your duke outs about who is the most beautiful woman of all. So when the text says that they left everything, it doesn't mean they left behind their wife and children. But that's everything, isn't it? It doesn't mean that they left their house because we're going to find out that in the ministry of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, Simon's mother-in-law is in his house when Jesus comes in and works a miracle and heals his mother-in-law. It's not like he left his house just abandoned and went on and followed Jesus. We need to think very clearly what the text is really saying they left, their, they left their everything, is what it means, so they could follow Jesus. But Jesus has already told them to follow him, at least two of these. And now he has to say it again. The point that we want to make right now is that this calling required a choice. When we get all theological and we start talking to people about something called Calvinism and we start talking about people, uh, the Catholic Church teaching original sin or modern Protestantism talking about total hereditary depravity and, and how all of that makes it impossible for us to do good. In that moment, what did Jesus ask those people to do? Make a choice. Follow me. And if Jesus didn't believe it was capable, they were capable to make that choice to follow him, what was Jesus doing? If Calvinism is right that they could do no good at all? If original sin means that they were so corrupted it was impossible for them to do God, do anything good without God causing some act of grace on their lives? What does that mean? It's called human tradition about something that is entirely wrong. And Jesus' words in telling, telling them, follow me, means that they could. So I'm telling every one of you in this room, whatever Jesus has asked you to do, you can do it. Full stop, period. Yes, it might feel hard. Yes, it might seem impossible. Yes, it might look like these apostles who recognize they are not apostles yet. Okay, I'm going to leave everything that's important to me so I can follow him. The calling required a choice. And of the two that are here in this group of four, they had already declared in John chapter 1 that they knew and they understood that He was the Messiah. He is this one that has come. And, and, and everybody get this drift. I want you to see. They had already declared He is the King. He, he is the King, the, the Messiah that we have been promised. And six months later, Jesus has to come back to them and say, follow me. Are you as strong of a Christian today as you were six years ago? 
Are there things in your life that cycle in your life where you don't focus on the things that matter most and that are deeply spiritual? And you have to be reminded to be cycled back to the things that are true? Well, guess what the disciples were like? Just like you. And so when someone walks up to you and reminds you of your obligations, or they remind you of the need for your faithfulness, it is not because they do not love you any more than it. Jesus did not love these two men when He says, follow me. And yeah, by the way, I told you that six months ago. But I want you to be reminded what Jesus did not say. Jesus did not say, follow me. I told you that six months ago. Get up and get going. Jesus said, follow me. And I will make you fishers of people, the Christian standard says. Most translations say people, uh, fishers of men. Jesus did not want them to miss the point that the choice was theirs to decide. But when Jesus says, follow me, Follow after me and I will make you fishers of men. He'll say that also in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Months had passed. But notice Jesus doesn't give them this call to be a follower of Him without giving them some sense of obligation and identity and more importantly, task. He doesn't want them to just be busy doing things. He has them to do specific things. I will make you fishers of people. He didn't just want them to go organize a Bible study at the synagogue. He didn't just want them to organize some kind of uh, choir uh, or study of the Torah or He says almost intentionally, if you're going to be fishers of men, you have to follow me. Because that's what truly the first challenge of changing our perception of discipleship is really about. Following him. That's why Jesus could say, if you're going to love your father or your your mother or your brother or your sister more than me, or even your life, then you are not worthy of me. You remember this passage? Look in 1 Corinthians. The church at Corinth gets a lot of press for good reason, because of the letter that Paul wrote in answering the questions that the Corinthians had. But before he begins to answer their questions in chapter 7, because verse 1 begins, now concerning the things about which you wrote, he begins answering them. But the first six chapters he addresses the problems that the people of Chloe had informed him were happening in the church at Corinth. And so notice he says in verse 10, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and with the same conviction. For it has been reported to me about you, my brothers and sisters, by members of Chloe's people, that there is no rivalry among you. What I am saying is this. One of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. In fact, I did baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't recall if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, the good news, not with eloquent wisdom, so that Christ's cross will not be emptied of its effect. I want you to catch that. 
that when Paul addresses their division, notice he doesn't say, hey, by the way, don't you remember Jesus' prayer before he died? How he prayed that we all be united and let's all get together and let's all unite on his word. I'm not saying that that's not an application from John 17. But when Paul addresses the division that was happening in Corinth, he does not return to that. What he returns to is the reality of what it really means that you belong to Christ. Notice he said, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I say this. And then he says, I want you to understand this because everyone, you will empty the cross of Christ of its effect if you do what you're doing. Division is bad. Period. Because it empties the cross of Christ of its true and ultimate meaning that if we're going to divide what that really says, everybody, with all due respect to everyone in the world who has ever been a part of it, someone's not following Christ. When Jesus said, follow me, that's the first challenge of the change that's got to change in your mind. That when you became a Christian, it wasn't to join a church. When you became a Christian, it was not to make your spouse happy. When you became a Christian, it was not to get the preacher off your back. When you became a Christian, it was because you knew Jesus Christ's cross had a meaning. And that meaning was the salvation of your soul. And that meant your life belonged to Him. The challenge of that change means that it's about following Him. And please, let's all understand that. But notice in Luke chapter 5, something else happens. We love the Apostle Peter because I don't know why it is that we always seem to relate to him. But the more that I think about Peter and all the things for which he gets great press about his behaviors, um, he's still a whole lot better than me. I never do half of the good that he did. But the Bible says that Jesus sees the two boats on the edge of the lake, and he gets into the boat and starts to teach the crowds as they're sitting on the shore. That's why this is not John chapter 1, because that's not what's happening in John 1. And then notice as he is teaching the crowds, he finishes and says to Simon, put out into the deep. And Simon replies, like any good fisherman, I know these waters. I know these fish. And if I put out and I did not get anything in return, this is a waste of time. But his answer is, instead, we worked hard all night long and caught nothing, but if you say so, I'll let down the nets. To be a disciple means, not only have I learned in my mind that I... It, it's me following Jesus. Now everybody, you're going to learn what Jesus teaches you about what the Bible says. You will also learn Jesus about having people show you more accurately the things that are taught in Scripture. All of that's true. But just Peter in that moment illustrates this truth that it's about obeying Him. Peter could have said, you don't know how to fish. <laughs> Peter could have said, where's your boat? And, so, and I, I recall very distinctly having a study with someone who actually was a preacher for a large church. And we were studying, and he said, where's your church? <laughs> in other words, I had no authority in the conversation because... Where's your church? Well, Peter could have said to Jesus, well, where's your boat? Where's the proof that I need to listen to you because 
What do you know about fishing? But notice Peter says, but if you say so, I'll do it. To use that to go back to that illustration with that person, the only authority that ever should drive you to do anything is not because the preacher said so, but because your Lord said so in the word you have read or you have heard. Because that's what Peter did. Lord, if you say so, I'll do it. Do you obey Jesus like that? Or do you wait for some better understanding about some things? You know, I, I'm not going to make a decision about that because that just doesn't really sound right. You know, baptism for the forgiveness of sins, that just doesn't sound right. Well, everyone, if those are the words of what the Bible says and you're refusing to do what you know the Bible teaches, how can that be discipleship? If Jesus is truly the master of your life and you've given your life to follow Him, and I'm talking to the audience who are Christians, that's what discipleship looks like. Obeying Him. And Peter manifests this in spite of his weaknesses at times. But then notice, keeping reading. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish, so much so that he called his partners, James and John, and their boat to come over and help them. So amazing was this draw that it says that they were all amazed, verse 9, at the catch of fish that they had taken. They were all amazed. But it says in verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me because I am a sinful man. And we're struck with that. I hope that you see that. But notice James and John don't do that. Neither does Andrew. Only Peter. Not to make more of it than is clear, but what that simply means is that in that moment, Peter saw whatever it was in his heart that needed to surrender to the authority of what he had witnessed in Jesus working this miracle. He is this great king, this great master, and now I see that this is some great power that he has to bring for us all of this fish. And he says, I am a sinful man. And notice, when Jesus hears him say that, Jesus doesn't say, yeah, that's right, that's what the psalm says, for all have sinned. Notice, Jesus doesn't answer to Peter and say, well, you know, that's right, that just like David said about himself, you know, that uh, I, I was, depending on which translation you're reading from, in Psalm 51, verse 4, I was born in sin. Jesus does not even accentuate the confession of sinfulness that Peter confesses to him. God does, Jesus doesn't reply to that. But I do believe he replies to it because I think he knows where it's coming from. This is Don's understanding. You don't have to agree with it, but it's my understanding of what transpires. Because Peter had seen Jesus six months to a year earlier. He had heard his own brother tell him, this is the king that we have been, hurt, being, we've been waiting for to set us free. Peter followed him. And Peter went back to fishing. There was nothing wrong with that, but he went back to fishing. And Jesus tells Simon, when he hears those words, don't be afraid. What was it in that moment that made Simon confess to the Lord, I am a sinful man. <laughs> Get away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. And then for Jesus to turn around and say, well, but just don't be afraid. Isn't it ironic that Jesus chooses the moment to find 
Peter and Andrew, James and John, when they are engaged in their most lucrative business. A business that is described for James and John, that when they leave, and we'll make a point about this later, that they leave behind the servants as well as their father in the boat. I think Peter's response of his own sense of sinfulness was that he was afraid to keep following Jesus because of the insecurity of that reality. How many of you would quit your job to go to Africa with me? How many of you would would give up what you have just so that you could go over there. And I'm not, don't misunderstand, I'm not suggesting that that's a requirement of you being a Christian or you being a disciple or you being some super Christian. I, who cares about super Christians? But I think Jesus intentionally came to Peter and Andrew, James and John when they were in the, the work of their business on a day when they had produced nothing. And he wanted to show them that he could produce anything. Because if you're going to trust me, Jesus is saying implicitly in what he's doing, if you're going to trust me, then you have to know I can take care of you. What did Jesus do to the entire nation of Israel when they wandered through the wilderness? Do you remember what he did? Every day from the sky, He provided their bread. Every day from the land, He provided their meat. And every day, He gave them instructions about how they were to receive that bread, receive that meat, and that they were to follow those instructions. And when they didn't, they got rotten, smelly, awful. But He gave them instructions, and He provided everything. And we could say all day long that they had to go out and gather. I get all of that, everybody. But God provided it by grace. Every day. Every day to remind them that He was the God who was the King of the universe. He was the God who provided everything. He was the God who brought them up out of Egypt. He was the only God. And so when Jesus is beginning to call these men to follow Him, to make them fishers of men, He needed to see them He needed to help them see on the day when they could provide nothing that by grace, Jesus was going to provide everything they needed. And I know that all sounds great and wonderful. But Jesus says that to you too. Look in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 25. Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more uh, worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to your lifespan by worrying? And what, why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, what he do much more for you, you of little faith? Don't worry. Don't be afraid, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's about following Him. The challenges that we are facing when we become disciples, it's about obeying Him, doing what He says, even when it doesn't seem like, well, where's your boat? It's about 
having faith in Him and not being afraid. And then one last application we'll skip to in Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5 again. Notice verse 10. I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong passage. I think. I'm sorry, I am on the right passage. So look in verse uh, 9 of Luke 5. For he and all those who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners, leaving behind his family. Jesus tells Simon, don't be afraid. My translation says, from now on, you. From now on, you. will be catching people. And the Bible says that they brought the boats to the land. They left everything. The other Gospel, Matthew, tells us they left behind the father and the hired servants and they followed him. Because in those words, Jesus says, it's time to decide. I told you to follow me six months to a year ago. Now I'm telling you to follow me and become fishers of men. When Jesus says from now on, He wasn't asking them to change their vocation. Remember, they returned back to fishing in John 21. That was not an indication that they were some kind of sinners and that they were so worldly and had gone back to the world. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul did as he went from city to city? That evil thing that he did? Do you remember what the evil thing was that he did? He made tents. No, he wasn't doing anything wrong or sinful. From now on means you have to decide if you're going to be a disciple who your master really is. It wasn't a change of vocation. It was a change of purpose. So as we conclude this lesson, pointing us toward the next one, that once we realize that we've changed purpose, as these, uh, they, they aren't yet called apostles, by the way. They're still disciples. They haven't yet been assigned in the group of twelve within the text. That occurs later, much later in Matthew. So Jesus is still calling these first four, and He's telling them, I want my disciples to be fishers of men. I realize that these four are apostles. But Jesus is calling us bit by bit to understand the sanctity and the holiness and the mission of what He came in this world to do. He did not come to topple governments. He came to set people free. And the only way that these disciples could ever teach that message as if they could finally understand that message for them. And Peter did. Get away from me, Lord. You're a sin- I'm a sinful man. Have you gotten that message yet? Because tomorrow we'll talk about what it is that disciples need to not leave Jesus from John chapter 6. When all of the other disciples, after the teaching of pre- uh, preaching of Jesus about the bread of life in John chapter 6, others will go away and He says, are you going to leave too? We'll talk about that tomorrow morning. And then finally the lesson that Jesus intended all of these disciples to belong in community that He will call His church. On this rock I will build my church. Jesus made us to be disciples so that we don't live apart. We live together. And I don't mean in the same house. Y'all don't want to live in my house? I'm not sure I want you to live in my house. There's not enough room for you. At least all the time. 
You can come anytime you want to, though. It's the idea of us living in fellowship in the work God has given us. If being a disciple to you is coming through a door in a church building and sitting on a very comfortable chair, let me take you to Africa. Being a disciple was for Peter and Andrew, and for Philip and Nathaniel or Bartholomew, when they first heard was, follow me, come and see. And now for these disciples it was, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Tonight, if you're ready to follow Jesus, he told you how. It's not because you're good. It's because none of us are. And He promised to those who would believe in Him, repent of their sin, and be immersed into water for forgiveness of sins, He would make them new again. With the promise of a life in an eternal kingdom, and even more so, life with Him. I came that they would have life and that they would have it abundantly. So tonight, if you're a Christian and you need to be encouraged, I know the elders would want to encourage you. But if you need to become a Christian, to become a disciple, the Bible's clear. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know who said that? You're a master. Won't you come as together we stand and as we sing. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have. If you are ever in the Colleen area, we'd certainly love to have you worship with us. You can learn more about us and our times of worship at westsidecolleen.com. Tune in next time and be sure to subscribe to our podcast. All together worthy, all together wonderful to me.